Good morning, church, and welcome to Zion Online. My name is William, and I'm the worship and ministry coordinator here at Zion. Pastor Brad is not going to be preaching this week because this past week he's been on a time of pastoral retreat. And so he has been resting, he has been restoring, and he will be joining us again next Sunday to lead us through a worship gathering and reflection focused on Pentecost and the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in God's world. And so we look forward to having him back with us. Today, we have a special guest joining us on Zion Online, and that person is Pastor Steve Coy, who is the campus minister at Queens University in Kingston. Steve's been a campus minister at Queens for over 10 years, and he loves being able to work with students and to invite them into experiencing who God is uh, and who God is in their lives and who God calls them to be as they venture beyond university and into uh, their calling. And so we're super glad that Steve is here being able to share God's word with us today. Now, Zion is a church in the heart of the city of Oshawa. And as you can see, I'm wearing my Zion t-shirt this morning because when I put it on, it reminds me not only why I come to work, but one of the reasons of why I follow Jesus. Zion helps me in my walk with Christ because it makes things so clear. See, Zion as a church exists to live in relationship with God, to live in relationship with other people, and to live in relationship with our city. And so we do that. We gather, even online, to live in relationship with God, to be challenged in his word, and to listen for his voice as he speaks to us and guides us. We live in relationship with people because we believe that God loves people. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the world to bring us back to him. And so we live in relationship with people. But also, we live in relationship with our city. We love the city of Oshawa. We care about it. 
And we believe that God calls us to serve in the places that he has put us in. And so we do that as a church community. And as we serve the people of Oshawa, as we serve the city, God shows us more of himself in the people that we serve. And so one of the exciting things that we get to experience each week is watching that in action, relationship with God, people, and city. This past week, our food bank opened again on Thursday and was open from 9.30 till 12. Our food bank staff are faithful and they show up and they continue to serve people food. The need is great. And we are so thankful for our food bank staff, but we are also thankful for you as you help us uh, and support us in being able to serve the city through the food bank. Just last week, someone from the city of Oshawa, someone that we didn't know and isn't part of our Zion community, stopped at the food bank to drop off a $500 check just to say, we appreciate the work you're doing and we hope this helps you as you serve. Isn't that amazing? Even you as a congregation, as a Zion community, have donated food, you've donated funds. And because of that, the food bank has been able to serve, not from a place of nearly running out, but from a place of abundance. And that's just awesome. And so we've really experienced God's provision through you, and we're so grateful for that. Now, perhaps you want to uh, take an opportunity to thank someone from the food bank staff. Or maybe you see someone in your community, in, in your neighborhood, or at your grocery store that you see serving. I would just encourage you to do something different this week and maybe even write that person a card or give a phone call to the grocery store or the place where you see someone going out of their way and just really express appreciation for what they do. Take that step to encourage someone this week. Now, I want to ask us that question that we were asked in the video this morning as we prepare to worship, and that is what obstacles are preventing you from either perhaps worshiping or from being able to sit in God's presence and be able to dwell and rest in that. You see, there are so many things that compete for our attention. There always have been, but there are even more so today. I think even of myself, I scroll through Facebook and I'm just inundated with articles about COVID-19, about the economy, about the future, about vaccinations, and suddenly I'm just overwhelmed and I'm distracted. There are so many things that there are to be afraid of in our current reality. And so perhaps this morning you feel overwhelmed by fear and that is a distraction preventing you from being able to worship or dwell in God's presence today. Perhaps you're looking to the future and there's something in your life that there's so much unknown about right now whether that be your health, whether that be finances, there are so many things that could be unknown in this present reality. And there might be that one thing that in not knowing, it acts as a distraction from helping you to worship God and experience his presence in this moment. And so I want to take a moment to help us to focus our minds, our hearts, and our souls even as we live in this world full of distractions. I'm going to read some words from the psalmist, David, who, in a time of distraction, looks to God and tries to focus his mind, his heart, and his soul on who God is and what God provides for him. And so as I read these words, think about that thing in your mind that distracts you and just name it. Bring it to God and say, God, this is distracting me this morning. And so I bring that to you. And I just want you to be able to help me be able to worship you this morning and experience your presence, even though I have this thing going on in my life. And so let's take a moment to hear these words from Psalm 121 and to name that distraction. The psalmist writes, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. 
He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. No, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Would you join me in prayer? And so, God, we turn our eyes to you this morning. Even with those many distractions in our lives, even when we have other voices speaking into our minds and our hearts that try to distract us from you, even though we experience moments where we are overwhelmed, where we experience moments of anxiety, moments of despair, moments of uncertainty about the unknown future. So God, even with all of these things, even though they don't automatically disappear when we gather in this place, we know that you are with us and that you don't tell us to check our baggage at the door but rather that you invite us into your presence with our baggage and you say, bring it to me, lay it down at my feet and come experience my mercy and grace and my love for you because you are my beloved child. And so God, in our present reality, we come to you. We ask that you would speak into our lives, that you would transform our hearts and that you would help us to experience your presence this morning and that we would truly turn to you in worship as we offer you our voices, but more than that, as we offer you our lives. And so God, you are here in this place and we acknowledge that and we say thank you for being here. In your name alone we pray, amen. Good morning, church, and welcome to worship this morning. Whether you are in your pajamas or you've gotten dressed, whether you are in bed, at your kitchen table, in your living room, by yourself or with family, um, the Lord is with you. The same Lord that came to earth to die on the cross for each and every one of us. He is with you. And upon his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, People cried out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And there were Pharisees in the crowd that said to Jesus, um, Rebuke these people and tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. If these people were silent, the very stones would cry out. And so as we gather together this morning in worship, not physically, but spiritually we are together as one, as the church, as we join together. Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. So as we join with creation this morning, it says, Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye, if I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. So would you join us this morning as we sing the mighty power of God.
For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son. The one who believes in him shall not perish, shall have eternal life. John 3.16 Sometimes we hear the same thing over and over and it loses its meaning. And I feel like John 3.16 can be one of those one of those verses where we've grown up saying it, we've we've had to use it as a memory verse like like Noah. Um, and so we don't really focus on on the purpose or, or what it's the message it's trying to to put forward. And I feel like confession we can approach that like that too. Um, we do it every Sunday, we've been doing it for years. And so it's kind of just like a, a thing that we just pass through to get to the sermon. And I want us to pause and to really think about what it is that we're doing, um, why we come, why we come to God, and, and we we offer up ourselves and we offer up the things that we're struggling with, um, things that maybe we've come brought to confession a hundred times, and it still feels like God, I need a breakthrough here. I've asked you to do this, but it hasn't happened. And we can get impatient, or we can, it just it doesn't seem interesting, or I don't, I don't know. Um, but this morning, I, I just encourage us to, the things that have been challenging us, the things that may have been challenging us for years, um, areas in our life where we may be holding on to unforgiveness that we haven't let go, um, those things that we need to surrender to God, I just Let's, let's bring them before him now. Um, so in this silence, I just, I challenge you to search your heart and, and, and really just ask God what are the areas of your life, the areas of our lives that we just, we often don't want him to see or we don't want to let go of. So in this silence, I invite you to close your eyes and just be still.
from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God. so much for the opportunity to share a message with you today. But before I jump in, I just want to say a huge thank you for all of your support for our campus ministry. Even though things ended a lot differently than any of us expected this year, we still had an amazing year on all of our campuses. God transformed the lives of so many students as we lived out our mission to be an incredible community where people experience Jesus and his transformation. If you'd like to hear some stories of transformation, some testimonies, you can go to our website, genevahouse.ca, or you can email us and we'd be happy to send you our latest ministry report. It's full of stories of how lives have been changed, and I know when you read it, you'll be encouraged. So thank you again for all of your support. Thank you for your partnership in our mission to disciple young adults. Now the passage I'd like us to look at today is Luke 17 verses 11 through 19. Now I've been reading through Luke every morning in my devotions and when I came across this section it made me think about the situation that we find ourselves in today. Now I'm not sure all the ways the coronavirus pandemic has impacted your life, but communally life has been shaken to the core. We're all facing scenarios that we've never faced before. Globally we're bombarded with sickness and grief, anxiety, financial uncertainty, and isolation. It seems like so many things have changed and most of them not for the better. In Kingston, you're not even allowed to sit on a park bench anymore. The other day, a couple of our Geneva House residents were sitting down by the water and they were sitting on a bench and a bylaw officer came up to them and threatened them with an $800 fine just for sitting there. Well, let me tell you, that didn't sit well with them and so they ran all the way back to Geneva House where they can sit for as long as they want. Things are very different now. And in a time like this, I think it's so important to turn to God and to ask him to help us and to speak to us. In a time like this, I think we need a word from the Lord. We need some encouragement, we need some direction. And I think Luke 17 can offer us both. He has some rich wisdom as to how to live as followers of Jesus in the midst of struggle. And I'm excited to, uh, just to reflect on it with you today. Before we jump into our text, let's say a prayer together. Holy Spirit, this is our prayer. Please speak to us. We want to hear you. We need to hear you. We're surrounded by lots of voices, but we only want to hear one voice today. We want to hear your voice. And so please speak to our very souls as we reflect on your word and transform us, we pray. Amen. Well, leading up to our passage, Jesus was making his way up to Jerusalem. And as he went, he stopped along villages, along the way, 
to teach about his kingdom, and to heal people from all sorts of sickness and evil spirits. In Luke 17, Jesus is about to enter into a small town when he comes across 10 men who have leprosy. Now these 10 men see Jesus coming and they cry out desperately to him. And do you know how Jesus responds? He turns to them and he speaks powerful words to them, words that would change their lives forever. Let's read the story and see how God wants to speak to us today. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance. And they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now because leprosy was so contagious and so dangerous, anyone with the disease had to practice strict social distancing and isolation. They could only be around others who had leprosy, and so that often meant that they weren't around their family, they weren't around their friends, and because it was over 2,000 years ago, they didn't have technology like we did, so they couldn't Zoom into a meeting or Facebook time with friends. The life of a person with leprosy was filled with loneliness and isolation. And it was filled with hopelessness because there was no known cure for the disease. So catching the disease was usually a life sentence. As a result, these 10 men were so desperate to be healed from the sickness and so desperate to be free from their struggle. When Jesus saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now in Hebrew culture, when people with leprosy were somehow miraculously healed, which was pretty rare, there was a special ceremony that took place to welcome them back into the community. If you want to read all about it, you can turn to the Old Testament, to Leviticus 14. It has all the details. And those details are very specific. You know, they involve rituals and sacrifices, washing hands and shaving heads, and many days of quarantine. It was a very extensive process that proved they were disease-free and no longer a danger to others. So the ten men left, presumably, to go through the ritual. But as they were leaving, verse 15 says that one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Now the fact that he was a Samaritan was a big deal because Jewish people did not like Samaritans. You know, Samaritans were their distant cousins, well, and they had disobeyed God's law, and they had intermarried with the Assyrians. And as a result, Samaritans were considered impure to the Jewish people. They were an unclean people group. And, and there's great irony here because it was the most unclean of the unclean who came back. The most unclean of the unclean embraced not just the gift, but also the giver. And he came back and he fell at Jesus' feet and praise and submission. And Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. You know, there's always so much that we can reflect on when we look at a piece of scripture. There's so many layers, such deep truth. But as I reflected on this section, and as I thought about all that we're going through with the COVID situation, infecting our lives in one way or the other, I felt that there are at least three things that our passage was calling me to do. And I wonder if these three things might be something God is calling all of us to do. The first thing I was challenged to do when I read this passage was to focus on Jesus more. Have you ever noticed there are a lot of things in life that are trying to get our attention? The other day, I wanted to find a recipe for pork tenderloin, a tenderloin and, and my wife, Julia, suggested I look on Pinterest. Have you ever been on Pinterest before? I hadn't really spent a lot of time on it, but I always listen to Julia, so I thought I'd give it a try. So I went on a Pinterest and found a nice-looking piece of pork tenderloin. And everything was going great up until that point, but as soon as I clicked on that link, all of a sudden, it was like I was in Times Square. There were ads popping up everywhere. Big shiny boxes that said, 
follow me, subscribe now, click here, look at me, look at me, look at me. And most of them had nothing to do with cooking. It took me a long time to wade through all the distractions, even to find an ingredients list. And if you ask me, looking for tenderloin instructions on Pinterest was a recipe for disaster. I was hogtied by all the visual stimulation. And okay, maybe I'm just hamming it up a little bit here, but have you ever had an experience where pop-up ads were just bombarding you? The CBC had a mind-blowing article a little while ago which talked about the science behind apps. And it turns out that app designers are using neuroscience, the study of the brain, to get people hooked on their product. You can find a link to the article in the handout I prepared. One designer who runs a firm called Dopamine Labs said this. He said, to make a profit, companies need your eyeballs locked in that app as long as humanly possible. They're all in a technological arms race to keep you there the longest. I guess they figured if it meant making more money, working with neuroscience was a no-brainer. The app designers are trying to get into our heads and they want control of our minds. And the big goal is to keep our attention. They're trying to reel us in. Well, I am not immune to this. And so one of the games I got hooked on is called Homescapes. Have you ever heard of this game? Homescapes is a seemingly harmless little game where you design a home. You add on rooms, put in furniture, and help a guy named Austin to fix up his place. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? But here's the catch. In order to do all these things, you need stars. And you get stars by playing this little match game. If you win, you get rewarded with more stars. If you lose, well, you can try again as long as you don't run out of lives. If you run out of lives, you have to wait or you can buy more lives. And you need lives to get the stars to unlock more rooms and to go to the next level. And there's always next level and if, and if you let yourself get sucked in before you know it you've just spent three hours of your life that you'll never get back glued to your screen playing homescapes and for what purpose well I got a lot of stars and I made the app designers very happy if it's not homescapes it could be snapchat or Instagram or Facebook or Minecraft or whatever else is giving you push notifications right now it seems like there's an endless line of people who want our time and our focus. And sometimes they can distract us from what is most important in life. One of the big goals of our ministry on our campuses is to get students connected to God on a deep level. And one of the ways we do this is by inviting them to be part of discipleship groups that we call huddles. Now huddles are designed to get students reflecting on the Bible and listening to what God wants to say to them. And we encourage them to spend time doing this every day. And that may sound easy, but it actually takes a lot of discipline to do this. Students often struggle with making time to listen to God. And do you know why students often struggle with this? Well, they tell me there are so many distractions. So many other things to do. I thought it would be fun to do a little survey with them, so I asked them all to tell me, well, some of them, not all of them, I asked some of them to tell me the top three things that distract them from spending time with God. Do you want to see what their answers were? The number one answer was, maybe you guessed it, their phone. Number two was school, and number three was actually a tie between Netflix and worrying about their future. If you were to come up with a list of your own, what would it look like? What distracts you from spending time with God? Anything can become a distraction and can get in the way of spending time with God if we let it. You know, in our story, the 10 lepers realized that they were given an amazing opportunity to meet with Jesus. God was coming close to them and all they had to do was call out. And when they reached out, Jesus met them in such a powerful way a way that would change their lives forever. I realize that everyone's specific situation is a little different today. Some people are being forced to stay home and other people are being forced to go to work. For some, the daily routine hasn't even really changed that much. But I think for all of us, 
Today is a great day to focus on Jesus more. When everything is changing, we can hold on to the truth that Jesus remains the same. He never changes. And this present age is a time of preparation for an eternal age where Jesus will be the main focus. Our life is a time of training for what comes next. And one of the best things that we can do is to learn to focus our whole lives on what is most important in life, Jesus. So here's some questions for reflection. In a normal day, whatever that means for you, how much time do you spend focusing on Jesus? What distractions keep you from paying attention to him? And what can you do to make Jesus more of a priority? So challenge one is focus on Jesus more. The second challenge our text raised for me is this. I need to praise God more. You know how we said the app designers are messing with our brains? Well, it turns out that practicing thankfulness can also impact our brains, and it can even lead to greater mental health. A study by the University of California, Berkeley, found out that gratitude has lasting effects on the brain. They write that being thankful can set us free from toxic emotions, and it turns out that the more thankful we are, the more thankful we become. Isn't that interesting? In our text, the Samaritans, or the thankfulness of the Samaritan man, stands in stark contrast to the other nine who had exactly the same experience. The Samaritan was grateful. He praised God because Jesus did an amazing thing for him. He was released from a terrible struggle and given a new life. But I wonder this, what if Jesus didn't heal him? What if his prayers were not answered the way he wanted? Would he still praise God? You know, when I thought about all this, I was reminded of another man in the Bible who was also afflicted with a skin disease. He had boils all over his body from top to bottom. His name was Job. Now, Job is often held up as one of the best examples of a person in the Bible who endured tremendous struggle. He had it all, and then he lost it all. And eventually things turned out for him again, but not before he had to go through terrible loss. He lost his finances, he lost his family, and he lost his fitness. He experienced tremendous highs and lows, and his life was a bit like the stock market right now. And if we were to map out his life, it might look something like this. The book of Job is an authentic and honest look at his pain, his questions, and his commitment to God. And one thing that Job said always stands out for me. As he was grieving all that he had lost, at one point he fell to his knees and he, and he said this, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Praise the name of the Lord. When I read that verse, and when I read our text, I'm challenged to praise God more no matter what the circumstances. You know, I'm pretty good at praising God when things go exactly the way I want, when God gives me exactly what I was hoping for, but I'm not very thankful when things don't go well. Would I praise God if I lost everything? A classic song that comes to mind is Matt Redman's Blessed Be Your Name. Now, for some of you, that's a really old song. For others, it's a a new song. On your outline, there's a link to a good version of a, on YouTube that you can listen to later. And here are a couple verses that remind me to praise God when things are going well and to praise God when things are not going well, when things are challenging. Maybe you know these words, but here they are. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. But... Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Here are some questions. Who are you most like? The healed man who returned to praise God 
The nine healed men who got what they wanted but didn't come back were Job. How quick are you to praise God? What can you do to praise God no matter what the circumstances? That's our second challenge. Praise God more. And the third challenge from our text is this. Have more faith. Someone once asked Billy Graham to give him or to give them a simple definition of faith. And Billy Graham responded by saying this, faith simply means believing that something is true and then committing our lives to it. In the Bible, faith means believing in God and in what Christ has done for us to make our salvation possible and then committing ourselves to him. So faith has these two big parts, right? Believing and surrendering. In our story, the Samaritan showed faith by doing both of those things. He believed what Jesus said and he surrendered his life to Christ, falling at his feet. And did you notice what Jesus said to him in verse 19? Jesus said, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Ten men were healed, but only one had faith. Now, we don't know what the next month or the next six months or the next year is going to look like. And that can be a very unsettling thought. But what do we know? What are the unshakable truths that we can hold on to? What does the Bible say that we can put our hope in and that we can trust in? Well, we can trust God when he says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41.10 We can choose to believe that God will meet all of our needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 And we can know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28 what do you need to believe about Jesus? That he loves you? That he'll take care of you? That he can save you from whatever trouble you're experiencing right now? And what do you need to surrender to Jesus? Where are you holding back? Is there an area of your life that's off limits to him? Is there something that you're clinging to that's keeping you from clinging to Christ? What would it take for you to fall at Jesus' feet and to give your life to him and to call him the master of your life? Faith is believing and surrendering. And if we have faith, what else do we really need? When chaos strikes, it shows us that we are not in control of our lives. And it reminds us how much we need God. The ten men cried out to Jesus because they knew there was no one else who could help them, no one else who could save them, not the way God could. When it seems like everything is out of control, there's still something we can do. We can turn to the one who has control. Today, let's focus on Jesus more. Let's praise God more. And let's have more faith. And let's remember these words from Jesus who said, here on earth you may have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we trust those words that you have overcome the world. God, there is, there is so much going on in our lives. So many things are out of our control. And God, we need you so much. Lord Jesus, we pray, be our master. We pray, be the Lord of everything. We fall at your feet. And we surrender our lives to you. And we pray, Lord, help us to focus on you more, Jesus. Help us to praise you more no matter what is going on. Help us to have more faith. We trust in you, we believe in you, 
and we know that you will guide us through no matter what happens. So we surrender and we say, Jesus, we need you.
brothers and sisters in Christ, as we head into another week, may we go with that challenge to continue to find time to focus on God, to find time to praise God more as we live our Monday through Saturday lives, but also that challenge to go into our week, even with the various things that compete for our attention, even with all of the things that cause fear and cause anxiety, even with all of those things that are so unknown as we look to a future. Let us go into that reality with that challenge that we've been given to have faith and to look to God, who is the source of all of our help. And for God's blessing this morning, I would invite you to hear these words from Scripture Um, that Noah Brill is going to share for us. He memorized them and spent a lot of work doing it. And so as he recites these words, may they soak down into our souls and uh, encourage us as we go into our week, knowing that the Lord blesses us and keeps us. And so hear these words. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.